Yesterday I spoke on glory when heaven invades earth. Who can I give this copy to? It pays to sit on the front row, okay. And today's message, no, the Lord has changed my direction for this morning, so I'm going a different direction. God's still writing your story. Is the book that touched this one. Okay, bro, I can't get Naomi off my mind. I think I'm supposed to talk for a couple of minutes about Naomi. Uh, for, this is for somebody here. You're, uh, you're helping me. Thank you. That's going to help me right there. I think that the book of Ruth is misnamed. I think it should be called the book of Naomi. Because when you're reading the story, you're actually not reading Ruth's story. You're reading Naomi's story. It's a redemption story. And Naomi is this woman who suffers incredible losses and then comes through a horrific grieving season and where God restores her fortunes. So that at the end of the book, her daughter-in-law, Ruth, is married to the rich guy, Boaz, and they've produced a child by the name of Obed. And Obed is being nursed by Naomi at the end of her life, at the end of the story. So it goes from that she has, she, had, she loses her husband, she loses her two sons, to at the end of the story, she is nursing Obed. The Lord has given a son to Obed. And when you look at the story as it progresses, as it ends, you're just like, that wasn't really much of a redemption story. I mean, she lost her husband, she lost her sons, and okay, so she's nursing Obed, you know, but, but uh, Naomi goes out not really knowing her redemption story. It's not going to be uncovered until around 150 years later. 150 years later, somebody looks at David on the throne and they go, wait a minute, don't you have a great grandmother in your lineage that has a story? And David's like, go find that story. And so they go into the Chronicles, they dig up the story of Naomi and realize through the trauma of her journey, she has given birth to the lineage of King David. And the redemption element in her story didn't even manifest until 150 years after she died. I love the redemption stories in the Bible and, uh, because I'm, I'm contending for one myself. So I'm going to just share with you some things uh, th this morning from my own journey with the Lord. You can probably imagine, and I'm thinking there's many in the room here, that you have been, as, as I have been, in a trial where it's challenging to stay in faith. Because the circumstances you're looking at, you're like, you know, this just doesn't look so good right here. And, and, and uh, it looks like my life is over and God has abandoned me and where is this going? And it takes eyes of faith to see what God is doing in the tragedies of life. And in my tragedy, I'm just being honest with you, my pursuit has been in my tragedy to find divine purpose in the losses I've endured. Psalm 77, my spirit makes diligent search. And when you find yourself in a trial, that's kind of what happens. Your spirit goes into this diligent searching mode. God, what are you doing? What are, what, 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 what are you saying here? What are you seeing? What are you speaking over my life? Where is this going? What 
is your purpose? Why have you allowed all these forces to wreak havoc in my life? And your spirit is searching diligently for divine perspective. And so that's been my journey for 27 years. And I'm just going to share some stuff uh, from the overflow of that. I want to talk about having eyes of faith. Because when you're in a trial, that's what you're fighting for. You're fighting to see what's happening in your life through a lens of faith. Unbelief can never see what God is doing. Never. The only way to see what God is doing, you've got to get in faith. Because unbelief looks at the facts. Unbelief looks at reality. Unbelief looks at circumstances and figures that it's really in reality. But unbelief actually rewrites the narrative. So the narrative that God is writing Unbelief rewrites that narrative. Has anybody here ever had your kids rewrite the narrative on something that happened in your family? Like, they'll tell you, they'll recount a story from your family history, and you're looking at them like, is that how you experience that? Well, let me give you a little perspective on that story because you didn't realize. You thought we were depriving you. Let me tell you about this, this, and this. We were protecting you. But unbelief will rewrite the story and cast God as a villain so that instead of being thankful and worshiping him and giving praise for his kindness, unbelief actually enters into the accusations of the enemy and speaks accusation against God. And so we want to find eyes of faith. We are, we are in pursuit of faith. Paul said it twice to Timothy. He said, pursue faith. That's my pursuit. I know that's your pursuit. We're in a violent pursuit of faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to uh, the Word of God today, I'm asking that you would give us eyes to see what you are doing. Open my eyes, Lord, to your activity, to your purpose, and to your heart. In my family, in my circumstance, in my job, in my church, in Jesus' name. When the twelve spies came to the promised land, and you'll recall that Moses uh, sent out twelve spies to check out the promised land, and Numbers 13.32 says this, They gave the children of Israel a bad report, saying, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And the reason they said that is because when they were spying out the land, they noticed an inordinate number of funerals. People were dying. Like, why? Are all these people dying in this land? They left Egypt with funerals happening. They step into Canaan and now there's more funerals happening and they're going, what's with all the funerals? And they're young men in their prime that are dying. And the eyes of unbelief of the tent, they look at it through unbelief and they go, this is a hostile country. It devours its inhabitants. And they're going, God has brought us out of Egypt to set us up for failure. Caleb and Joshua are looking at the exact same thing, and they're going, and this is uh, Numbers 14, verse 9. They go, 
their protection has departed from them. They said, the Lord is with us, don't fear them. So the eyes of faith, Caleb and Joshua, looking at the exact same thing, funerals in the land are going, their protection has departed. God is already fighting for us. And they're going, like, don't you remember what God promised us? He said that he would cut them off. He said that he would send hornets in. God is already fighting for us. And so the eyes of faith are looking at it, going, God is with us. God is for us. Unbelief is going, God is against us. The ten are looking at the same thing and going, this is horrible. The two in faith are going, this is awesome. The ten in unbelief are going, God has set us up for failure. The two in faith are going, God has set us up for our inheritance. Your destiny is determined by what you see. The eye of faith will see what God is doing through the tragedy, through the trauma. Who could have seen what God was doing in Naomi's life until 150 years later? And we're going, wow, it really was a redemption story. Lord Jesus, give us eyes of faith, I'm asking. Lord, would you help us to see what you're about, your holy purpose in the trials and circumstances of life. Now I'm thinking about Joseph. I'm going to talk about how Joseph had to find eyes of faith because when you're in prison, you really need to see God's perspective. When Joseph, when Joseph was 17 years old, it's as though the Lord says to him, Way to go, bro, man. You're, you're nailing it. You're separate from your generation. You're holding your heart before me. Joseph, congratulations, bro. You get a promotion in the kingdom of God. To slavery you go. And now Joseph finds himself in slavery in Egypt, and he's just faithful in Potiphar's house to cultivate his gifts and his talents. And God comes to this young kid a second time and goes, Joseph, good job, man. You're faithful to cultivate your gifts and talents. And, and you said no to Potiphar's wife. Way to go. You get another promotion in the kingdom of God. To prison you go. Has anyone been in God's promotion system? <laughs> and now, in prison, Joseph is desperate to get God's perspective on his prison. What are you thinking? What do you see? Because all that Joseph can see is, I'm going to die here. And he begins to labor to understand his present, especially because of how it ha it's a stark contrast to the dreams that he's received. God's given him these powerful dreams, and it just seems like whatever those dreams were talking about, it sure, this prison is definitely uh, not, the, we're not connecting the dots on this at all. And Joseph decided to study his God language. Joseph's God language was dreams. That's how God talked to Joseph. And so Joseph in his prison, he's like, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to study dream language. Like, dream interpretation. How does God talk through dreams? Because he's desperate to understand his dreams in the middle of his prison. He studies his God language, and that's what gets him out of prison. When the butler and the baker come and have a dream,
dream, he is now able to interpret their dreams. And then when Pharaoh gets a dream, now he is able to interpret Pharaoh's dream. And the thing that got him out of prison was knowing his God language. What's your God language? How does God talk to you? Identify it and then study it. Might get you out of your prison too. And Joseph is in a prison where he's going deep into the heart of God because he just cannot understand why this is happening to him and he starts pressing deep into the heart of God. And here's what I think is happening with Joseph in prison. Joseph, in my opinion, was a five-talent guy. He's one of these guys that everything he touched turned to gold, you know. He's got the people skills, he's got the admin skills, he's got the money skills and the accounting skills, and he's got the brain power, and he's got the personality and the charisma and the charm, and he's got the whole, he's even good looking, if you know what I mean. He's just got the whole package, and he's got a burning on all burners. And everything he's touching is being blessed and turning to gold. And God comes to this five-talent kid who's got it burning on all burners and goes, Joseph, you're good, but you're not good enough. Okay, you got five talents, but what I have for you goes beyond your talents. And if I leave you uninterrupted, you will never discover the dimension I have for you. Here's the weakness of five talent people. They tend to rely on their talents. And a good, I mean, a good five talent worship leader can pull off a service without the Holy Spirit. You know what I'm saying? And God comes to this competent, skilled, developed, five-talent kid and goes, I've got something for you that goes beyond your talents. And for you to find it, my friend, I'm going to have to shut your talents down. So he puts him in a prison where his talents are rendered useless. When you're in prison, I don't care what your brain power is. Your smarts aren't going to get you out of prison. When you're in prison, I don't care what your people's skills are like. They're not going to get you out of this prison. I don't care how good of an accountant you are, Joseph. It's not going to get you out of this prison. I don't care about how strong your business skills are. They're not going to get you out of this prison. And Joseph finds himself in a context where every talent that he had ever cultivated and made fruitful in the kingdom of God was shut down. And God's like, son, you got to go deep in the spirit. Because there is a dimension in the Holy Spirit that is not by talent, it is not by gifting, it is not by strength, it is not by might, it is not by power, but it is by my Spirit, says the Lord. And sometimes to help us find the Spirit realm, the Lord will help us by shutting down our giftings that we rely on to force us to go deep into the heart of God to find a dimension that is beyond our giftings and our talents. Joseph, you're good, but I, if I leave you alone, you'll just stay at the level of your giftings. I am calling you to become a feeder of nations. But to enter into that destiny, you've got to find a dimension that goes beyond your gifts and talents. Not by might or power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So God's looking at Joseph's prison in a different way than Joseph is. And Joseph is trying to find that perspective. And one of the passages that really helps me with God's perspective on Joseph's prison is Psalm 105. I love this portion. 
where God is giving his perspective on, what, on Joseph's prison. Psalm 105, verse 16. Moreover, he called for a famine in the land. He destroyed all the provision of bread. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. Now, uh, verse 17, uh, we don't quite have it just yet, but verse 17 says that God sent Joseph ahead of the brothers and sold them as a slave. Now, when you read Genesis, it doesn't read like that. When you read the story in Genesis, his brothers did it to him. But when you read in Psalm 105, God goes, actually, it was me. <laughs> Joseph, as long as you have your eyes on what your brothers did to you, you will remain a prisoner to their rejection. But if you can lift your eyes to what God is doing in your life and see from heaven's perspective, you will become a player in a drama that it's going to become the best, one of the best stories in all of Scripture. Verse 18. I'm not sure if we've there. I think they're working to find it for our screen. Verse 18. They hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons. Until the time that his work came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people let him go free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions to bind his princes at his pleasure and teach his elders wisdom. I'm going to ask them just to keep that scripture on the screen for us for a moment. When Joseph came out of prison, Psalm 105 says that he came out with the authority to bind his princes at his pleasure. He came out with the authority to put back into that prison people in the very prison that he once was in. So when he imprisons his brothers, he's putting them in the very prison that he was in himself. Now, I have a theory about Joseph. I can't prove what I'm about to say with the verse, so I call it a theory. But when Joseph came out of prison with the keys to that prison, I think he went back to that prison. You're coming out. Hey, my friend, you're coming out. My buddy, you're my new prime minister. Come on out. Uh, he'll be staying in. <laughs> and when Joseph came out of prison, he came out with authority over the very prison that held him. I believe God wants to give you the same experience in your imprisonment. Could it be that through your consecration, by the time you come out of this prison, you will come out with authority over the very prison that once held you. Never relent until you hold in your hand the keys to the prison that now holds you. Unbelief looks at Joseph's prison and goes, you know what, it doesn't even pay to believe. It doesn't even pay to cultivate your gifts and say no to temptation. You end up in prison anyways. Faith looks at the Joseph prison and goes, God's preparing a vessel who will become a feeder of nations. Lord, give me eyes to see. When I'm telling you, when 
you're in a prison, you need eyes of faith to see what God is doing in your circumstances. Lord, give it to us, we pray. Here's someone else that informs me on this, Caleb. Caleb is the guy that, you, you'll recall, when they came to the promised land and Moses sends out the 12 spies, the two of them, Caleb and Joshua, were in faith. And so Caleb, he goes into the promised land, he comes back, he's like, guys, we can do this. God is with us. He's got faith to go in and take the land. But the people believe the evil report of the ten. And so because of the unbelief of the people, Caleb does 40 years in a wilderness. And I'm going, that is not right. That is just unfair. That's a raw deal. Caleb has the faith to go in, but because they don't, he's got to do 40 years in the wilderness with them. The Lord was like, actually, I'm looking at it from a different perspective. Why don't you look at the Caleb story one more time? So I'm looking at the Caleb story a second time. They come through the 40 years in the wilderness. There's five years of taking the land. It's now 45 years later, and Joshua is giving everybody an inheritance. You get a house in a field. There you go, sis. God bless you. Hey, bro, house in a the field. There you go. Go, go, go. Hey, my, my, my man, house in a the field. There you go. God bless you. Hey, sister, house in a field. It's Caleb's turn. Caleb goes, I don't want a house in a field. I wanted a house in a field 45 years ago. If you think that I want today what I wanted 45 years ago, I've just come through a 40-year wilderness. Count them. 40 years, dust-filled, viper-enhanced, scorpion-enriched, a wilderness for 40 years. He says, I no longer want what I wanted 45 years ago because the wilderness changes what you ask for. He's like, I want more. I want a mountain. Somebody goes, well, who does Caleb think he is asking for a mountain? We just got a house in a field. Why does Caleb get a mountain? Actually, nobody complained. Caleb wants a mountain? Because he did the time. When you're in a 40-year wilderness, you are buying authority. You're buying authority with people and with heaven to take a whole mountain in the kingdom of God. I can imagine the Lord in his heart thinking something like this. Caleb, I love you, man. You're my kind of guy. I love your passion. I love your devotion. I love your faith. I love your, 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 your diligence. Caleb, I want to give you a mountain. But if I give it to you on this side of the wilderness, the whole nation will be in an uproar. So work with me here. Just do 40 years. <laughs> Caleb, if you will endure in faith for the next 40 years, by the time you have endured 40 years, you will have an authority with the entire nation and authority with heaven to ask for and to take a mountain in the kingdom of God. Wilderness, you're buying authority. 
somebody looks at your wilderness and they go like this. Well, if you had more faith, you wouldn't still be in this wilderness. That may be true, but look at Caleb. He got himself in a 40-year wilderness because of his faith. Okay, I'm going to share with you four keys to waiting on God from the life of Caleb. I'll find something to write this down. Okay, borrow a pen, borrow, get out a device, punch it into a, into a device or something. Find some way to write these four things down. Four keys to waiting on God from Caleb's life. You're going to want to keep this. They don't exist. You do the time. We need in Michigan some mothers and fathers. Ah, we're beyond Michigan at this conference. We need it in America. We need in this land today men and women that will walk a journey with God, that will endure a wilderness, and will actually buy the authority in the kingdom so that they can take a whole mountain in the grace of God. God, give us some Caleb's who will endure a wilderness so that they are so enriched that they have something to give to another generation. Do the time. You look at Caleb's wilderness through the eyes of unbelief and you're looking at that thing going, yeah, it doesn't even pay to have faith to go in. You're still going to have to do 40 years. The eyes of faith look at it going, he's buying authority to take a mountain. I want to look finally this morning at the cross of Christ. I'm a little bit distracted by the cross at this time of year. Easter Sunday morning does not quite scratch my itch quite enough. I just get distracted with the cross and it's on my radar. And so I just, I just, what do you see when you look at the cross? You know what the world sees? Cosmic child abuse. The eye of unbelief, the eye of cynicism, looks at that through a critical lens. But we look at the cross through eyes of faith. We see the Father giving his Son a gift of cosmic proportions. When I look at the cross, I see the balance beam of Christianity. Every imbalanced doctrine has moved away from the cross. And the cross is always inviting us to come back to the center. When I look at the cross, I see the anchor of our faith. Because when your faith is being shaken in a storm, there's really only one thing that can anchor your faith in a faith crisis, and that is the cross of Jesus Christ. When I look at the cross, I'm looking at my GPS, because when I don't know my way forward, when I don't know which way to go, the cross tells me, you walk the Via Dolorosa. The cross is the emblem of my faith. Now, there are some, uh, I had a brother one time, he said to me, I don't think we should make the cross the emblem of our faith, he said. I think we should make the empty tomb the emblem of our faith. He said, I don't think you should wear a cross around your neck. If you're going to wear something around your neck, he said, I think you should wear an empty tomb around your neck. And actually, I don't agree with that. Because for me, the compelling distinctive of our faith is not that God is alive. There are a lot of faiths that believe that. The compelling distinctive of our faith is that God died. 
where did this idea come from? I'll tell you right now, it did not come from planet Earth. This was not a man-made idea. This came from heaven. What other religion boasts in the death of its leader? There's a movement on today to minimize the cross. There are some that are like, uh, let's not talk about the cross so much. Let's not talk about the blood and the wounds and the suffering and the gore and the horror. And, we, and there are some that think that, well, let's just not, not talk about that so much. But Jesus didn't quite see it that way. He said, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. The cross has a gravity all its own. The cross, if you lift it up, it will draw people to Jesus Christ. You don't have to defend the cross. All you have to do is exalt the cross, and the cross will draw people to Jesus. So I'm the kind of guy that goes, I think we should talk about the cross on the job to our neighbors, with our family, with our friends. Let's let the cross become again the centerpiece of our conversations. At the cross, I denied him, I betrayed him, I tried him, I handed him over to Pilate, I beat him, I spat upon him, I put thorns in his brow, I drove nails in his hands, and then I rammed a spear into his side, and here's what he did back. He washed me off. He changed my name. He gave me a brand new robe. He put a ring on my finger. He put sandals on my sh on my feet. He pulled me up to the family dinner table, and then he gave me the family fortune. I am in love with the cross of Jesus Christ and the lavish love that he has shown on the cross. <clears throat> I'm a lover of the cross. I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell you why, okay? Uh, through the journey I've been on, I'm speaking of my voice now, the vocal affliction that has afflicted me for 27 years and the suffering through that journey. When you're suffering, you go to the cross. And so suffering has made me a friend of the cross. I love Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ. Has anybody seen that movie, The Passion of the Christ? I'm a lover. Uh, every Good Friday, I'm like, let's watch it again. I love to get up close. But the scripture that I want to come to about the cross right now is not up close. It's looking at the cross from an eternal perspective. It's Genesis 3.15. God is speaking to Satan about the cross, and this is actually millennia before the cross. And here's what the Father says to Satan, Genesis 3.15. He, that is Christ, shall bruise your head, Satan, and you shall bruise his heel. This is God talking about the cross with eyes of faith from an eternal perspective. He says, Satan, you will bruise his heel. He's going to bruise your head. When Jesus was on the cross, nails in his feet, nails in his hand, thorns on his brow, lacerations all over his body, when he was on that cross, my friends, I promise you, it did not feel like a bruising of his heel. It felt like a crushing of every molecule in his being because it was. 
same is true for you. When you're in the vortex of your trial, you feel like you're being pulled apart molecule by molecule. And you probably are. But there is an eternal perspective to be found on your trial. I think if we could talk to Jesus today, right now, and ask him, Jesus, talk to us about the cross. Like, what was it like for you? He might say something like this. That was intense. I really took it in the heel. But my adversary has been bloodied in the head. And I'm suggesting that the Lord wants to give you the same perspective in your suffering, in your crucifixion. As you endure in this trial, there will come a day when you are going to look back on the excruciating trial that you're in right now. And you're going to see it from a totally different perspective. The eyes of faith, you're going to be going... I, I took that one in the heel, all right. But my adversary has been bloodied in the head. I believe that God wants to use your trial to train you in spiritual warfare so that you can lay a blow to the head of your adversary. Satan regretted taking Job on. He regretted taking Jesus on at the cross. May he also regret taking you on. May God do more through your trial than if the trial had never happened. At the cross of Jesus, Satan and Jesus went at it. And they were both aiming for the head. Satan hit the heel. Jesus made his mark. So if you want to learn spiritual warfare, don't go to the adversary. He's not that good. Go to the master who will teach you how to lay a blow to the head of your adversary. I'm preaching to myself right now, my brother. I'm like, I am in this thing, Lord, to be your Padawan learner. Would you show me how to so endure in this crucifixion that by the time the story is over, I will have laid a blow to the head of my adversary. When I look at the cross of Jesus, and I'm thinking, I've got, I've got scenes of Mel Gibson's movie flashing in front of my eyes right now. When I visualize the cross of Christ, I see blood on his head, blood on his cheeks, blood on his neck, blood on his shoulders, blood on his chest, blood on his back, blood on his arms, blood on his hands, blood on his legs, blood on his feet. There's blood on the cross. There's blood on the ground. It's just a spectacle of blood everywhere. Listen, Satan was more bloodied by the cross than Jesus Christ. Jesus was wounded by the cross. Satan was destroyed by the cross. Is there anyone in the room this morning that has the desire to do damage to the kingdom of darkness? I've got a couple friends in the house, okay. You may take something in the heel. Epic victories come at a price. If 
Jesus couldn't destroy Satan without incurring scars. What makes me think I can? If you have no scar, were you even in the battle? But the scars we incur in this warfare, he dignifies them. They become the emblems of our marriage bed, where now we reach our hand into his side and caress the scars that brought us the love of God. And then he reaches his hand into the side of his bride, and he caresses her scars, for she now bears in her body the marks of Jesus Christ, and our scars become the tokens of our intimacy with Jesus. If you're going to do damage to the kingdom of darkness, don't be surprised if you take it in the heel. But Lord, give me eyes of faith to see that what I am enduring right now is but a wounding of my heel in contrast to what I'm going to do to my adversary. Teach me how to lay a blow to the head of my adversary. I'm finished with the message. Lord, I'm asking, give us eyes of faith. Help us to see what you are doing. Help us to see what uh, what's in your heart. Lord, I'm asking for my friends that are in, in a trial right now in this room, some in this room, that, that uh, Lord, we just, we just we're overwhelmed by the natural data. We're overwhelmed by the things that we're feeling and seeing and experiencing. And the voices of unbelief are so strong. Lord Jesus, I'm asking, would you open our eyes to what you are doing? Open our eyes like you open Elisha's servant's eyes to see the, the armies of heaven. Open our eyes to what you're doing, we ask. In Jesus' name. You know what? I'm going to just do one more. I've got five minutes. Let me just do one more thing for five minutes. How do you get eyes of faith? I'm going to do this from the life of David. I think I can do it in five minutes. This is how to get eyes of faith. First Samuel 16, verse 13. If they, I don't know if they've got it on the screen. First Samuel 16, 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. This verse explains the life of David. You cannot understand the life of David without this scripture. When Samuel anointed him with oil, the Holy Spirit came on David from that day forward. It was a remaining anointing. And when the anointing of the Holy Spirit came on David and stayed upon him, it transformed his glasses. And I want to show you how it changed his glasses. The next chapter is 1 Samuel 17, and I'm looking at verse 26, if they can help us on the screen. 1 Samuel 17, 26. I want to show you how the abiding anointing of the Spirit changed David's glasses. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine? and takes away the reproach from Israel. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Go back just one phrase, back to uncircumcised Philistine. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? When David looked at Goliath, he didn't see a champion of darkness. He saw an uncircumcised Philistine. And I'm going, David, what kind of glasses do you have on? And David's going, I'm not quite sure, but ever since Samuel did that to me, something's come on me and I don't see things the way I used to. Now when I look at a champion of darkness, I see an uncircumcised Philistine. And I'm going, can I get some of that anointing on my life, please? Because I want to have the spirit resting upon my life so that when I look at the challenge, when I look at the mountain, when I look at the obstacle, when I look at the problem, when I look at the culture, I don't see a champion of darkness. I see an uns
uncircumcised Philistine change my glasses. And then the next point, the last part of the verse, that he should defy the armies of the living God. David looks at the armies of Israel and calls them the armies of the living God. When Saul looked at his armies, he got depressed. Ragtag bunch of underfit, under-equipped, understaffed, under-prepared, under-monetized, under-everything. Bunch of losers. Saul got depressed by his army. When the army looked at themselves, they got depressed. When David looks at it, those armies, he sees the armies of the living God. David, what kind of glasses do you have on? David's going, I'm not quite sure, but ever since Samuel did that to me, something's come on me, and I, I don't quite see things the way I used to. Now, when I look at the people of God, I see the armies of the living God. When you look at your home group, what do you see? The most dysfunctional random group of people in our whole city. When you look at your worship team, what do you see? Can never find their Bible, always late to practice, tough to get them in a consistent schedule. When you look at your congregation, what do you see? Show up two weeks out of four, can't hard to get a tithe out of them, won't ever volunteer for anything. Or do you see the armies of the living God? Holy Spirit, would you come on me like you came on David? Would you change my glasses so that when I'm looking at the enemy, I'm not seeing a champion of darkness? I want to see an uncircumcised Philistine. And Holy Spirit, come upon me in power and change my glasses so that when I look at the people of God, I see the armies of the living God. This is what changes our glasses. This is what gives us eyes of faith. It's the abiding, anointing presence of the Holy Spirit on our lives. Go ahead and just pray one more time with me. You can stand if you want to. Heavenly Father, I'm asking that you would anoint me in your Holy Spirit. I'm asking Abba, change my glasses. Open my eyes. Help me to see what others don't see. Help me to see what you're doing. Help me. Lord, when I look at my family, give me eyes of faith to see what you're doing in my family. When I'm looking at my church, oh Lord Jesus, give me eyes to see the armies of the living God. I'm asking, Lord, in my job, in my neighborhood, and in my place of employment, Lord, would you grant to us such a in uh, such, such a resting grace of the Holy Spirit on our lives that we would see what you're doing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God give you eyes of faith.